The kick and bass are undeniably the most important part of any electronic dance music track. You can have everything else right, but if your low end foundation isn't rock solid, you'll turn a potential banger into guaranteed tripe. What? Today I'm going to show you the 7 most common low end mistakes I see music producers making all the time that's ruining their tracks and more importantly I'm going to show you how to fix them so your music is going to sound rock solid against your reference tracks. It doesn't matter whether you produce house, techno, future bass or any other genre of electronic music, these 7 mistakes will ruin your track. My name's Will from EDM Tips and over the last 6 years I've helped thousands of bedroom music producers just like you get their music to a professional level and release on some of the world's biggest dance music labels. Now before I learnt about these 7 low end mistakes, I used to compare my tracks to my favourite producers and even if they were mixed really well or the luffs value were just the same, they would lack that low end body, groove and drive and punch that you get in professional tracks. Now after I learned what I'm about to teach you today, my music started getting signed and I got my first manager. And number 4 on its own will change the way that you make music forever. I know because I taught a producer friend of mine this and he's now got over 10 million streams on Spotify. But you'll get the best results if you identify all 7 mistakes and fix them, so make sure to stick around and watch the whole video. And don't forget you can download my mixing guide for free below this video which is going to teach you 30 of my best mixing tips for dance music. Firstly, what does a weak low end actually sound like? We have to know that before we know what we're aiming for. So here is a track that hasn't had these 7 mistakes identified or fixed yet. Okay, so it sounds pretty good, everything's working really well, but now let's compare it to the same track when we've had these 7 mistakes identified and fixed. Much more cohesive, much more driving, and if you can't quite hear the difference, let's compare them side by side and roll off all the top end using a low pass filter. So here's the first version. And now the second. Hear the difference then? So the first example on a huge speaker stack in a nightclub or a festival would just be sounding like confusing to everyone who is listening to it and it would just kill the vibe on the dance floor. Whereas the second one has much more punch, clarity and groove so everyone on the dance floor would absolutely love it. If you enjoyed this video please remember to hit the like button, it really helps me out and I appreciate it and subscribe to my channel for tutorials each and every week and really cool things like the $10,000 music production giveaway that you can check out the details of there. Okay, with Without further ado, let's hop into the door and get it done. The first mistake that I see people making all the time is simply choosing the wrong kick for the wrong bass. So if you start your track with a kick drum and you really like it, you've then got to find a bass that's going to work with it and vice versa if you start your track and you come up with the bass line first, then you're going to have to find a kick that matches it. Now a quick rule of thumb, if you've got a very short sharp kick, then you can have a nice sustained bass. Conversely, if you've got a really short sharp bass, then you can have a longer more sustained kick. Anyway, let's listen to the kick and the bass soloed in this track just together. So this is what we've got at the moment. Now let's try and switch out that kick and see what happens when we get the wrong kick. Assuming that we've started this track with the bass, which is indeed what I started it with. So the easy way to test different kicks is to go into hot swap mode if you're using Ableton, but you can do this in most doors in some way or another as well. So I'm just going to try a couple of different kicks when we've got this bass line running. So you can hear straight away that's way weaker. And that is as well. That's kind of cool. But if you want to make your job even easier, then you have to take out the high frequencies of the whole track. The reason being, kick drums have low frequencies, mid frequencies and high frequencies, and bass lines usually have got mid range frequencies and sometimes high frequencies as well. So if we go to our master channel and just put any kind of EQ roll off and just take out all the high end above 100 to 120 hertz, now let's listen to just the very low end of our kick and bass. So that might make your job easier of finding a kick and a bass that works together. So let's find a different kick. That's a bit weaker. That's a bit boomy. But 
that one just fits nicely. So we're trying to find something that's got punch. So the bass line still has differentiation between the kick and the bass. And there's a clear hierarchy where you can hear that kick poking through. So now if we take the EQ off our master channel, we found the strongest kick for the bass line. And this is the number one mistake that people make. They simply choose the wrong kick with the wrong bass. Then they try compressing it, doing EQ, all this fancy stuff to try and make it work together. But if you just spend the time trying to get the best kick that's going to go with your bass, it's 10, 15 minutes worth spending because it's going to set your track up for success. Okay, number two, and that is mistuning your kick. Now there's a bit of controversy on the internet over about that. Some people will say, always tune your kick to the key of your track. Other people say, never do that because then the fundamental frequencies are going to mix with it. In my experience, I found sometimes it works better, sometimes it doesn't, but it's always worth checking. So once you've found the best kick for your bass line, as we've done here, now let's try and tune it to the key of the track. So the way that you can do that is first find the key of your track, and I can see my bass line here is hitting A, so I know this track is in A minor natural because I wrote it. So now we need to tune our kick to A and see if it sounds any stronger. And again, we can put the low pass filter on the master channel if that's going to help us. But let's find a way to tune this. So in Ableton, there is a device called the tuner. And it's basically just a way to see which pitch your kick drum is hitting. So let's put that on our kick. And let's see what it's hitting at the moment. Okay, so it's hitting an F and we want this to be hitting an A to see if it's going to work better or worse with our bass line. So I'm just going to go in and transpose it. Okay, that's already losing its character and not sounding good, so I'll transpose it up. So that's about A there. Now I actually prefer to do this by ear, and the way that you can do it by ear, uh, before we test this and see if it sounds better, is to put it up several octaves, and then you can start to hear the pitch of the kick usually. And then you can actually much more easily hear what note it's hitting. So if A is the key of the track, let's just go to a bit where the bass line is just hitting an A, here we go, and then tune our kick manually with the bass line playing. Dun, 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 dun. So now I know that kick is in tune, but obviously it's way too high. So the way that you can bring it back down to the best possible place is we can see we've transposed it by 40 semitones. All you need to do is go 40, minus 12, which is an octave, minus 12, minus 12, until you get as close as you can to zero. And in this case, it's plus four. So we can go to plus four. And now we know our kick is tuned to the key of the track. So whilst it's looping with the kick drum and the bass, I'm gonna go back to no transposing and see if it's any stronger. I actually quite like that. And the reason that this is working is because not only can you tune the kick drum to the root note of the track, you can also tune it to the third above the root note or the fifth above the root note as well. And if you want to know more about how intervals work, you can check out the video that I'm linking to there. And if you want to know the five best bass patterns to make your music awesome, you can also click the other link that's popping up now as well. So in a nutshell, mistuning your kick can take a lot of the power out of your low end. So it's always worth trying to tune it and then seeing if it's stronger or weaker than the kick drum in its original place. Okay, low end mistake number three, frequency masking. Once we've got our kick and our bass working together, now we need to see if the frequencies are clashing too much and whether it's taking the power out of the low end. So again, if we've got our bass and our kick just looping together, what I'm gonna do is put an EQ on both of them. I'll just load on a fresh EQ to make it easier to see. And if we load in EQ8, and I'll also put one on the bass, I want to see if the frequencies are clashing too much. And if they are, I'm going to take down some of the frequencies from the least important element. So in the kick, if we play that on our own, we can see our fundamental frequency here 
is, let's just open it up so we can see a bit better, where the biggest wave is. So this point here. So the fundamental frequency here is about E, which makes sense because E is the fifth above the A, so our kick is actually tuned to the fifth of the track now. And now let's go to the bass line and we'll see that the fundamental frequency will obviously be A because we programmed it on an A, but let's just have a look anyway. We'll open up the EQ. So we can see here it's A, and there's another A down there, which is kind of a uh, octave lower. Now knowing that the fundamental frequency of the bass is an A, we can actually go to our kick and we can decide, shall we notch out some of the frequencies at that A range? So I'm going to look at my kick, find out where A is, about here, 111 hertz. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bell curve at 111 hertz. Let's just program it in. And then I'm going to just notch down with the gain a little bit and see if it clears up a bit of room in that low end. So this is an extreme version. So I've done quite a drastic cut there with a kick on its own. Just takes a bit of boominess out and allows the bass line to pop through more, which is, means that we can get the entire mix louder as well when it comes to the mastering stage. So it gives your mix more clarity and ultimately you can push your final master a bit louder as well. So number four is gonna change the way you produce forever. But before we get onto that, let me know if you're enjoying this so far, give me a hell yeah or an amen brother if you are. And let me know in the comments, what do you want to see me cover on this channel? What are you struggling with? I will do my very best to help, okay. Let's crack on to the next low end mistakes I see people making and how to fix them. So number four is treating your bass as one instrument. Now, hold on for a second and I'll explain. We can see our bass here is actually two serums in an instrument rack, but it counts as one instrument. Let's just have a listen to the two different parts of it. So quite similar. This serum, first one just gives it some stereo width with lots of unison and then this one keeps it nice and tight in the middle to just give it more power. But the trouble is, with quite a wide bass sound, you can run into phase cancellation issues. So I'm just gonna put this little tool here called Ozone 9 Imager on the end of our bass. And we can see here, this little meter is ducking down to almost hitting zero. And when it goes below zero, we've got phase cancellation issues. And if we can look at our bass meter here, it's actually dropping in volume and increasing in volume because of this phase cancellation. So this is a really important thing that you can do with your bass. Create a separate sub bass line and keep that mono. So the way to do that, I'm just gonna duplicate my bass line like this. So the programming, it is exactly the same. I'm gonna get rid of all the effects because I want a really super clean sine wave for this. I'm also gonna just delete one of these serums, ungroup it. And now let's open this up. And you can see here I've got all this unison, which is creating the stereo width. But we don't want that. We want to make this a lovely mono sine wave. So I'm gonna take this unison right down to one. I'm gonna select a sine wave. And because I've duplicated the baseline, all of the ADSR controls, like the shape of the volume of our wave, and the filter cutoff as well is exactly the same because it's important to get your sub bass matching the same shape as your mid bass because if you don't, it can start going all weird and everything goes out of time a bit. So now let's listen to our sub bass and let's just call that sub bass. We're gonna take off this reverb. Oh, okay, we've got a second wave there. I'm gonna turn that off. And I'm gonna take it down an octave so it's even lower. Okay, that's too low. So we're gonna leave it there. Now, what you need to do next is make sure that you take out the sub bass from your main bass line. So if we go back to our main bass, 
can see here there's all this low end information. But we don't want that clashing with our dedicated sub bass. So I'm going to turn this uh, high pass filter on and just filter out everything under about 100, 120 hertz. So there are a couple of benefits for this. One, we're not going to run into phase cancellations with our sub bass. And two, you can now balance your mid and upper bass with the sub bass perfectly. So if you need more sub information, you can just bring it in. So let's listen to the kick and the bass, like so, and just bring in some of that sub bass. So you get to decide exactly how much sub bass your track has. Now this is a game changer. If you start doing this, I promise you, your productions will sound way better. Okay, next low end mistake I see people making, which is not side chain compressing your bass. Because if you listen to the kick in the bass at the moment, and we're gonna put our low pass frequency on, it's just kind of a constant long woo, 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 woo. So we need to duck that bass line against the kick. Now you can use a sidechain compressor to do this and feed the kick in, but what I'm going to do is use the LFO tool by Steve Dudder, but you could use Nicky Romero's Kickstart, or you could use Shaper Box as well. And these are just volume ducking tools. So if we see what's going on here, we're actually just ducking the beginning of the bass every time the kick plays. Which kind of makes it bounce. So this is with it off. And this is with it on. And that allows the kick to pop through the mix a bit more. So keeping the low filter on. Let's turn the LFO tool off. Oh, muddy. And let's turn it on. You can really hear that kick popping through now. So let's turn off the filter. Okay, next low end mistake I see people making is not using bussing. So the first thing I'm gonna bus together is my normal bass and my sub bass. I'm just gonna group them in Ableton, but that's the same as sending them to an audio bus if you're using a different door. And I'm just gonna call this bass. So once you've got your sidechain compression making space for the kick to pop through the mix, you've got the buses set up like this. So you've got the sub bass and the bass going into one bus, then the bass and the kick going into another. You can then process the kick and the bass together as I mentioned a second ago. So a great thing that you can do here is use a bit of compression and it's just gonna equalize the levels and make a nice solid low end in your mix. So the first thing I'm gonna do is add this glue compressor. So let's just solo the kick and bass bus, take the threshold down. Leave the attack on one, automatic release. And I'm just looking for about two decibels of gain reduction here, which I'm then gonna make up. So if we turn it off, it's just not quite as gelled together. So that's one thing that you can do when you're processing the kick and the bass together, but the other is to add a bit of saturation and you can even add some limiting to get some more body in your low end. So I'm going to use the Fab Filter Pro L2 here. And if we go to our kick and bass bus in the mixer view, we can see what volume we are currently hitting. In fact, let's turn off the glue compressor as well. We're hitting about minus 13 on the peak about minus 18 on the average. So let's turn the glue compressor on and this limiter and what I'm going to do is look on the limiter to get about one or two decibels of gain reduction because this bass line is kind of moving quite a lot so I just want to get everything locked in with a more consistent volume. So I'm going to put the volume up until we are getting some gain reduction. I'm gonna to have to take down the output so we don't deafen, deafen you. So we can see here we've got some gain reduction now. 
and we boosted this by about 13 decibels. I'm going to take it down by 13 decibels on the output. And it depends on the genre as to how hard you want to push this. But we can see here now, we've still got about minus 13 on the peak. It's quite subtle, but you can hear that the low end is just more solid, more consistent in terms of volume. This is off. Just a little bit flabbier. And having this compressor and the limiter just tightens it up a bit. Now for the last mistake I see people making when it comes to the low end, quite often they will go through all these advanced processes we've just covered They'll have their mix sounding really good, but then when they compare it to their reference track, it is still lacking a little bit of low end. And here is a fantastic tip for how you can fix that problem. So if we go to our master channel, in fact, let's turn everything on and turn off this filter. If you really want your track to just reach down a little bit deeper, this is how you do it. There's a plugin, it's a free plugin called Bark of Dog. And this is a game changer. So what you can do is you open it up and you can just put your kick in the bass if you want. It's going to be easier to put the settings correct. And it starts off, let's just put on a completely blank version actually. We'll go to Bark of Dog, which I've got here. Let's just load that in on our master channel. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to boost it quite hard and then I'm going to tweak the hertz until we get the fundamental frequency of the track. So now I'm going to listen out until the bass really pops through. About 42 hertz, you can hear it if you've got good headphones or monitors. The power starts to really come. So now what you want to do is dial it back to zero. And then you probably are looking for about six to eight decibels of boost here. Right, now listen to that difference. That's off. Off and on. And with the whole mix. So with everything together, all of those different tips that I've shared with you today, your low end is going to sound amazing. I've got so many more tips for you like that in my accelerator program. So if you want to get to a professional level as quickly as possible, have some one-on-one -on -one tuition, get feedback each and every week, do check it out below. It's the most effective program I've ever put together and we have a great time whilst we do it. And don't forget to check out the first EDM Tips Remix competition by clicking the link that's popping up now. You can win up to $10,000 worth of music production equipment. So subscribe to the channel, head over to that video and I will catch you over there. Thank you so much for watching guys. And until next time, cheers and happy producing. Oh, no, no.